beautiful is that though, right? Like God is our chain breaker. I mean, that it's just, it's huge. We're, we all get so trapped into different things that we just feel like we have these chains that are weighing heavy on us and we're singing this song about how God is our chain breaker. Uh, but before I get started this morning, uh, we've been each week, uh, we've been hearing from a different team member from our Moldova mission team. Uh, and so this morning we're going to be hearing from Carolyn uh, as she uh, kind of gives us a little bit more information about our team. Why don't you go with me? The little boy was in coveralls, but he ran to his grandfather and asked if he could go to school. His grandfather said, yes, you need an education. So Marion went to school with Gervais. Marion lived with his grandfather, and when his parents found out he had gone to school, they went to school and told the teacher, Marion needs to work in the field. Well, the teacher stood up to Marion and talked the parents into letting him stay. Gervais sowed a seed. I'm sure he had no idea what a seed he had sowed for many years later. He may not even realize he sowed the seed. He recently passed away and was a member of Town Creek Baptist Church. God used him greatly in our church. The little boy in coveralls turned out to be a lawyer and a judge. He's a judge for the 13th District Courts of North Carolina. His name is Honorable Judge Marion B. Warren. Judge Warren, who was a speaker at Cal um, Brunswick Community College this year, told this story about himself. When we go to Moldova, we are sowing seeds for Jesus. When we witness for the Lord, whether it's in our own community or overseas, we are sowing seeds. We're not responsible for making them grow. God, but we need to continue sowing wherever we are. God does the growth. Sometimes we see the harvest or we may never see the results, but our job is to continue to sow seeds regardless. It can be as little as putting a track in a bathroom stall or telling a friend how you came to know Jesus and how he changed your life. The enemy will try to steal your seed just like the parents of Marion did, tried to steal his education. I encourage each of you to consider going to Moldova. In Matthew 28, 19, we're given the great commission to go into the, all the nations to make disciples. It's a step of faith. In Luke 10, 2, he gives another command. The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Get out of your comfort zone. Start making your plans now. Trust God for your finances. Hebrew 11.1 1 says, Faith is the confident assurance of something we want is going to happen even though we cannot see it ahead. I live on a fixed income, and it's not always easy paying taxes on and insurance on two houses and paying for a trip overseas. But God is faithful. He always makes a way. We ask your prayers for travel and safety and that we will be bold in speech as we do God's work. Let us pray. Remind us often, dear Father, of the great commission you gave us and we need to sow seeds wherever we are. Remind us that little is much when we put it in your hands. Amen. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. I think that's a, uh, a great reminder on what we talked about last week. For those of you who are here, uh, we went through uh, Jonah chap chapter 1 and uh, talking about how uh, Jonah was kind of asleep uh, to this whole thing that God was trying to do. And he was outrunning uh, God from living out the Great Commission. Uh, and we went through and we kind of talked about how, you know, how important it really is for us to live out the Great Commission. And so I'm so thankful for our uh, Moldova team who's going out there and living it out. Um, so uh, I had originally, like when I was, I told you guys, Pastor Kelly told me a few months back that I would be preaching these two weeks so uh, that he could go and enjoy uh, Maine up there with, um, with Kelly and, and Emmy. And I don't know if any of you guys have been keeping up with on Facebook, but you know, Maine in the summertime is still fairly cool. I, I know I went in July a few years back, I think it was in 2010, and I put on like jeans and a hoodie because it was still like cold up there. Uh, they would have like 40 degree nights, 70 degree days, and some of y'all who have been experiencing this hot Wilmington heat this past week have been thinking like, that sounds like a good idea. Well, they don't have air conditioning in the cabins up there, and so Audrey and Kelly and Emmy, last summer they were all right, but they are also experiencing this unique heat wave. Uh, and so they are not uh, very cool on their vacation this week or so, uh, but it's, it's been a good time for them. I've, I've talked to them a few times. They, they've definitely been enjoying their rest. But kind of back to what we were talking about last week, I'd originally thought about continuing through the book of Jonah and talking about some different points and some different aspects of Jonah's life. And as I was going through uh, things this week, God was like, you know what? I got something different. And I said, okay, all right. So this morning we are talking on a, uh, um, my sermon title is, Are You Woke? If you want to put that up there for me. Anybody ever heard the word woke before? You think maybe I'm saying things wrong? Anybody heard this phrase? Okay. This is a uh, millennial, post-millennial terminology here for those of you who don't understand this. And a, a very simple definition for this is, if you want to put that up on the screen for me, is being aware of what is actually going on. Okay. Uh, in, in a context of a sentence, okay, you know, some of you guys will see, anybody keep up with like what's going on with like celebrities and politics and just things like that, other things going on in the world, sports teams, things like that, of course, we all do, right? Everybody keeping their hand down like, no, I only focus on Jesus all day long, that's it. Y'all need to wake up, y'all need to get woke, come on, it's all right, y'all can talk back to me, it's fine, all right, so... You know, in, in the context of a sentence, all right, you could, you could see, maybe see somebody put this out on like a Facebook post or tweet it out or something like that, and they would say, y'all have been keeping up with the Kardashians all day long while there's homeless people out on the street who need food, y'all need to get woke, okay? That is the context of the sentence. So this morning, our message is on this idea of are you woke, and I'm not going into the phrase, surprisingly enough, I'm not going to be talking about uh, going into the Great Commission and things like that, like I was the la last week and Kelly was a week before that. We got a little word from Carolyn on that this morning. I appreciate that. But this morning, I want to talk about, like, are you yourself actually woke spiritually? And so as I was going through this message this week, it, it was really challenging because I was like, you know what? Last week, I didn't really have time to do slides, so I'm going to try to do slides this week, all right? And they're going to be pieced together here and there. I don't have detailed notes, stuff like that. Pastor Kelly is so organized, and I love the man for that, but my brain doesn't work like that. But that's okay. So this morning, we're talking about this idea of being spiritually woke. And we talked a little bit on that last week with Jonah. Remember, Jonah was in the, the bottom of the ship, and it was this terrible storm that was going on. It was about to break up. It was about to fall apart. And he's just down there asleep because he has ran so far from God at this point that he doesn't even realize what's going on. It takes this pagan ship captain to come into the picture and say, hey, um, hey, buddy, can you wake up and maybe pray to your God? Because this is like crazy and we all about to die. All right. And we talked about how some of us are, have been like Jonah. We've been spiritually asleep to our call to go out and live out the Great Commission when we've got so many people in our community who need it. I, I've researched um, recently on, you know, kind of where Wilmington stood as far as evangelicals were. Okay, I'm not looking for Baptists or Presbyterians or just that they, they're, they believe in Jesus. Okay, what do you think the percentage 
of Jesus believers in the city of Wilmington are. Throw something out. 47, 30s, 50s, 70s, all right? There's churches everywhere you look, right? I mean, there's one right next door to us right here. There's one right here. There's one in the shopping center next to us. Uh, I mean, how many different churches that, that there are throughout this town? 35%. 35%. There are 65% of the people in this city who don't hold that Jesus is the Savior. That puts some things into perspective. That That means almost seven out of the ten people that you walk by don't know this freedom that is in Christ. But before we get into like going out and living out the Great Commission and everything like that, I want to make sure, and I want, I want, I want to make sure that, that you're there, that, that you've got this true identity in Christ. See, my story, and I shared a little bit on that last week, um, was I grew up in church. You know, I, I, had a, I had a great family. My grandmother is like, you know, like we can all talk to God, but like this woman has like this like direct line to God, right? Anybody got a grandma like that? Like, you know, like she talk, you know, like when she prays for something, like it's going to happen. Like her and God, like they, they tight, right? And, and then me, it's like I keep praying and praying and praying and nothing happening. But I got my grandma and she like, so I'm like, you know, hey, grandma, like I just need you to pray for this for me real quick. Like that's how I got this job was my grandma, you know? <laughs> like, uh, and so, uh, but anyways, it's, um, but, you know, so I grew up in this Christian home. Um, but, and I would have called myself a Christian my whole life. I believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection, all of that kind of stuff, but I didn't really understand what, it, what a relationship with Jesus looked like. I was very involved in my youth group, uh, about sixth through eighth grade. I was in there. Pr- we had a praise band. We had like 300 students in our youth group. It was a big youth group, and we had a lot of very attractive young ladies in our youth group, so that's why I went to youth group. Uh, but I was in the band. I was, um, I, I did, we had like a puppet ministry. Like, I know that doesn't sound cool now, but like, it was like the early 2000s. It was kind of cool then. The Muppets were still a thing, like represent, right? But, you know, now, I'm, now if any of my youth kids are in here, they'd just be making fun of me for sticking my hand up a puppet. But it's okay. Uh, but anyways, um, I was just so involved in church and everything like that. But then when I got into high school, my youth pastor got let go from our church literally for no reason. I really kind of stepped away from the whole thing. And I, and the reason for that was because I, every time I turned around, it was like I wasn't doing something right. I was continuously failing and messing up and things like that. And so I just, I just got to a point where I went from a faker to somebody who just didn't think they were good enough for it. And so I think that a lot of times when, when we're dealing with like our relationship with God, a lot of us fall into these two categories, and if we really get honest with ourselves, we know which one we fit into. Some of us are a faker, and we put on a really great church face on Sunday mornings, and we have all the answers. Like, I could have told you anything you, you basically wanted to know about Scripture, but I didn't really have a relationship with Jesus. And then I got to a point where I was just so far from God that I just didn't feel like I was good enough for God. And when I got my call into ministry, my mom kind of sat me down for the first time and told me, like, I think this is what God's doing in your life. I was like, nah, mom. Like, like I know, like, I, your mom and moms are always right, but, like, you don't know what I've been doing. Like, I am disqualified from this whole pastor thing. And even as I continued to go through school and go through seminary and everything like that, there were so many times in my life where I had these like moments of doubt of like, God, like I am not good enough for this. There's been so many times since I've been here in Wilmington serving for you guys full times that I've looked at myself and said, I'm just not good enough for this. But we serve a God who is bigger than we are. We, we serve a God who uses people who are very broken and who are seemingly very far from God in Scripture to do some amazing things. So this week, we're going to get jump into Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to start off. Acts chapter 8, uh, right there in verse 1. And we are going to look at this character named Saul. All right? So I'm coming at you with another familiar passage this week, and then we're going to talk about the, the conversion of Saul to Paul and how he went from like this mass murderer to this 
awesome Christian guy. And so we're talking about Paul's conversion and, and how we really can relate to this. Because there was this moment in, in Paul's life where he was a faker, where he was, and he also goes through this, I'm not good enough phase as well. So let me give you guys a little background on Saul, and we're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It'll pop up here on the screen for you. And it says this, okay, now Saul, in, the, in this little bit of background before we read this, um, there is one of the disciples named Stephen has just been stoned to death, okay? We're only like seven chapters into the book of Acts, like seven chapters after Jesus has finally ascended into heaven, and one of his disciples is already being killed for going out and preaching his name, okay? So Saul does this. Saul approves of his execution. He's talking about Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. They, they, you know, they were really upset about his death. And then verse 3 says, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison and then ultimately to be executed for following Jesus. Like that's the guy that we're going to be talking about this morning. All right? Paul, though, he, but here's the thing about, well, he's Saul at this point, Okay. Saul, he, he was claiming religion in all this. This is our first point here. Paul, Saul was claiming religion. Like, if you look at his life, like, he was a devout Jew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews is our next point here. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And we find that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. If you want to put that up on the screen for me. It says this. It says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. So this is, Paul is about to put out his spiritual resume to us, okay? This is before he became a Christian. This is before God got a hold of him. He says this, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Like that was like a per, like if you were going to be a perfect Jew, like you were circumcised exactly on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrews, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. Okay, now we know the Pharisees, those were the guys who put Jesus to death. Okay, Pharisees were the ones who took the law and they were so literal about it that they would go out onto the streets and they would just just ostracize people for absolutely anything and everything when it came to it. So he knew the law. Like, he would have been one of the guys who had scripture after scripture after scripture memorized. Like, he was a Pharisee. As to zeal, okay, just his passion, his drive, he was a persecutor of the church, okay? So Paul, like, he was like the perfect Jew, in a sense. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And he was going to take his religion so seriously that he was going to do anything that he could to stop anybody from coming up against it. Our next point is that he thought that he was honoring God in all of this. Because if you think about it, he was trying to stop something from coming in and interrupting what he thought was the truth. Like, he was so sold out to this whole idea of the Old Testament and what it was looking for. And he was so convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah that he was trying to stop what was going on. Paul was like a biblical times Hitler. He was going through and trying to wipe out Christianity so that it couldn't go any further, just like Hitler was trying to wipe out the Jews so that they couldn't continue on anymore. It was a massacre. It was horrible. And this guy, Saul, was just in the midst of all of this. He was the ringleader. What was really going on, even though Paul thought, or Saul at the time, he, even though he was claiming religion, he was this perfect Hebrew, he thought he was honoring God. I mean, he thought that God hadn't sent the Messiah yet, so he was doing the right thing for God. Like, he was convinced of that. The truth was, our next point, is that he was spiritually blind. He was completely and totally spiritually blind. But he thought he was doing the right thing. He really wasn't awake 
He wasn't woke to what was going on. So this morning, I got a couple signs that we might be going through this spiritual blindness ourselves. Now, I know, I, I, I think I know pretty well enough that none of you guys are going around killing nobody, all right? And you're thinking, oh, how can I relate to this, like, mass murderer, right? Um, but the, the truth is, is that Paul, what he was suffering from was this spiritual blindness. You know, we know that if we look at history, Paul was at least alive during the time of Jesus' ministry and his death and all of that, and then he came, in, came about and he was trying to stop the, the spread of the church and everything like that. And we'll see here in just a few minutes where he actually kind of joins in on the, on the team. But before we can do that, we, we want to go through these signs of spiritual blindness, like how we ourselves might be caught up in the same spiritual blindness that led Paul to killing Christians. Our first point is this. First thing is that we might be just doing church. You might be thinking, okay, what do you mean by that? Doing church. That doesn't sound like a bad thing, right? But there's a difference between doing church and actually being the church. You can do something all day long, but if you're not actually like sold into it, you're just doing an action. You coming here and listening and singing some songs every week is not you being the church. It does not mean that you have a relationship with Jesus. I'm just going to put it out there bluntly. Just because you come here doesn't mean that you have given your life to Christ. Just because you might even serve on a leadership position or teach a Sunday school class or something like that, that doesn't mean that you've actually given your life to Christ. It just means you're doing something. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case. Okay, I'm not saying everybody who's in leadership or a bunch of heathens or anything like that. What I'm saying is, is there's a difference between us doing church and being the church. And this morning, what I want you to do is I, I just want you guys to just be open to what God might be trying to tell you this morning. Because it's one of the hardest things to face, and it's something that I had to face when I was 18 years old. I would have called myself a Christian till I was blue in the face. But the truth was is that I did not have a relationship with Jesus. I was a complete and total faker. When I finally decided that I was going to go to Liberty and, and pursue youth ministry because my mom had like thrown the idea in there and I got like a bunch of scholarships to go to Liberty and they built this ski mountain so I could snowboard 365 days a year. And I was like, I'll go do that and deal with some Christian stuff. I, like, I spent that entire summer cleaning myself up. And I think that's what a lot of us do when we, like, think about Christianity. We, we try to, like, clean ourselves up first. So I stopped cussing for the most part. I broke up with my girlfriend that I'd been sleeping with. I stopped smoking weed with my friends, stopped going out to the parties and doing all that kind of stuff the summer between my senior year of college and my um, – between my senior year of, sorry, high school and my freshman year of college because I was like, if I'm going to go to this, this Christian university, i got to get myself cleaned up. I was like, and, and, and the crazy part was I, I even started, I was a manager for a life, as a lifeguard at a pool in our neighborhood, and I'd bring my Bible with me, and when I wasn't on the stand, I, would, I, I read all the way through, through all four Gospels and through the book of Acts and the book of Romans that summer. I wasn't somebody who didn't know scripture, and I was listening to my mom and the fact that I got all these scholarships to go to Liberty and things like that, and I was like, okay, yeah, I guess this is what I'm going to do with my life, and hanging out with some teenagers and stuff like that, that doesn't sound like a bad gig. I can still, like, skate and surf and do all that kind of fun stuff, right? And my job's not a joke, guys, I promise. <laughs> Kelly, don't you be giving me to my eyes, boy. <laughs> um, but that was my thought process. I got myself cleaned up, I got myself right with God and everything like that, but I still didn't have a relationship with him. I was just reading a book. I was just doing some actions. I was, what I was doing is I was being religious. And there's a huge difference between religion and a relationship. There's a huge difference between doing church and being the church. And I just want to know, Southside, if we've been guilty of just doing church instead of being the church. Because being the church is we are getting outside of these four walls and we're looking at that 65% of our community who is living in blindness and getting out there and telling them, like, look, there is hope out here for you. You don't have to turn to these substances to try to find happiness. You don't have to try to f turn to relationships that are broken. You don't have to look at your broken homes, your broken lives, and all of these things and think, what am I here for? Because we have that answer for you. But if we are going to just hold that into ourselves, then we are just as blind as they are. Let 
my second week at Liberty, I was sitting in a church service, and it's like the first time, like, I just, like, I was, like, kind of feeling it, you know, like, we, we, it's the largest gathering of Christian young people in the entire world. It happens three times a week at Liberty. There's 15,000 students who get together in this huge um, basketball arena, and we were having uh, this thing called Spiritual Emphasis Week, and where we really just kind of take the first week of the semester, and we have worship every single night, and we were just trying to give that semester to God, and you know, I showed up, and I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm Christian, the youth ministry major. Like, of course, my name's Christian. Like, it's, like, written on my birth certificate. Like, I follow Jesus, right? Um, and I remember, like, just being, it was August 31st, 2009, sitting in this auditorium with, like, 15,000 people, and the guy was up there talking. He was like, you know, some of you guys haven't really had this understanding of what a relationship was like. And before that, like, during the worship, and I, 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 like, raised my hand, like, for the first time, like, in worship. So I was, like, real spiritual, right? You know? I was, like, I got, like, there's, like, different signs of, like, where you put your hands. You're, like, I kind of want to worship God, but I don't want anybody else to know. And then there's, like, the, they're, like, yeah. You know? And then we got, like, this guy, you know? And they're, like, yeah, you, you're spiritual, but you get two hands up, like, you would, you and Jesus are tight, right? Like, you, that's how you know, right? And so, like, I put my hand up. I'm feeling good. I'm like, people are probably looking at me like I'm super spiritual. And then, like, God just, like, breaks me to pieces during this service and says, you know, like, Christian, you just, like, you haven't been living it out. Like, you know that. And, like, I'd kind of, as I'd been reading through the Gospels that summer, like, I got this understanding of, like, what grace really was and everything like that. And so I was like, okay, like, Jesus forgives me for all this, like, stupid stuff that I've been doing this, you know, these past four years of high school. Like, I get that. But there was still like this emptiness, there was still this void, and there was still this definitely very fake person putting his arm up during worship. And I and just in that moment, like they did this like altar call, and I was like, man, I just like I, I know God's talking to me, so I'm like, I'm standing up. Like he said, he, he said, you know, heads bowed, eyes closed, everybody stand up. I'm like standing up there, and I'm like, I gotta be the only one, because I'm like this right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, people are looking at me. But like I just felt like God's spirit just saying, like, no, nah, dude, this is you. You need to give your life to me right now. And he actually called everybody to come, anybody to give their life to come down to the front of the stage. And I'm like, I, I like didn't even look around. I just felt like I was the only person in the entire room. Like they all know that I've just been faking this. And I'm just like got tears in my eyes and like I've did I've given my life to Christ at this point. And in that moment, God just like confirmed like this, this is what you're going into ministry, whether you like it or not. And I still tried to run and all this kind of stuff. And I just was so stuck in at first doing church instead of being the church. And I, I slowly learned over my four years of college what it really meant to actually be the church and to have a relationship with Christ. And I missed my point. Thanks, Ron, for putting that up there. Complacency is what doing the church, doing church is, just kind of staying where we are. Our next sign of spiritual blindness is having this mentality of my church instead of the church. Okay? My church instead of the church. You can put that one up there for me, Ron. And, and, the thi- and here's, the, here's the deal. Oh, I forgot a passage. That's okay. We'll skip it. It's fine. Y'all got my point. <laughs> my church instead of the church. A lot of times we look at, you know, I talked about this earlier. We are on the same team, okay? We talked about this idea of there's, like, there's a church right here. There's a church right here. There's churches all over this city. And we think of, like, Baptist and Presbyterian and all this kind of stuff. Well, look, there's not a Baptist line and a Presbyterian line to get into heaven. Like, there is just a line to get into heaven, okay? And we are all on the same team, and we should be working together as collectively as Christians. Like, we all have our different churches, and that's fine. But we need to be working together collectively to live out this mission for Christ. But so often we get caught up into this trap and this idea that it's all about us right here. And in a, in a sense, like, at Southside together, we should be doing something. But there's nothing wrong with us branching out and reaching out with other churches and tackling this city together. We need to have this kingdom mindset instead of, like, this inward focus. Sometimes we get so focused on these inward walls. I'm not just saying Southside in general, but I'm just saying just churches in general. We get so focused on what's going on inside of our walls and trying to keep things together that we lose sight of what's going on outwardly and actually being kingdom focused. The other problem with this, this whole idea of my church instead of the church is confusing the enemy. A lot of times we look at people as the enemy. 
I, I see it all the time when like people are getting into their like political discussions on on Facebook and things like that, and they they look at certain groups of people as the enemy that are attacking things. As Christianity is becoming under more and more persecution in our in our country, we start looking at groups of people as the enemy. Some of us, we we look at a particular political party as the enemy against us. Sometimes we're looking at these different sins that are going on in people's lives and we're looking at them as the enemy. See, the enemy is not the sinner. It is not a person. The enemy is the devil and he is trying to work and persuade and say and, and control these people with different things. But so often, we are looking at that person as if they are are the enemy. When we have this my church mentality instead of the church mentality, we start looking and confusing the enemy. Our next idea for spiritual blindness is that we get me-focused instead of he-focused. We get me-focused instead of he-focused. So instead of having our focus and our attention on God and what he's doing, a lot of times we look at ourselves. We focus everything that we are doing to ourselves. We, we, we don't, we're not looking at what God is doing. When we sin, when we mess up and, and, and things like that, we tend to run away from God and try to hide that in a corner in a little box over here from God. But if you are saved, you have the spirit of God inside of you. And so he was literally present in the moment that you were doing it. So why do we run away from God with it? Why don't we just run to him with it? That's like my tagline. I say that to my students all the time. Instead of running to God, we need to run to him. If you want a relationship with God, if you just want like a very simple idea of how to have a relationship with God, run to him instead of away from him. Because he already knows what you've done. He already knows what you've been through. And 2,000 years ago, he hung it up on a cross and said, I'm done with it. He took care of it 2,000 years ago and he said, I'm done with it. And yet we hold on to it and we drag it around like it's a bunch of chains Like, it's stopping us from doing something. But God already knows you did it. He knew you were going to do it, and he took care of it. But we get so me-focused. Like, God doesn't want to use me because of all of my problems. And I'm sitting here telling you right now, if there's somebody who God didn't want to use from their problems, it was this guy named Paul, and it was this guy named Christian who's talking to you this morning. I went through the same thing that Paul kind of faces, and he's thinking, God doesn't want to use me. Some, some ideas, if we have this me focus instead of he focus, one of the things that we have is an inactive prayer life. Because of that idea I was just talking about of where we try to run away from God and hide from him instead of going to him. We have this inactive prayer life because we become me focused instead of he focused. Instead of focusing on God, we're focusing on ourselves and we have this inactive prayer life. Here's the beauty about having a relationship with Jesus is that he wants to talk to you even when things are rough, when things are bad, and when you feel like you're the lowest person on the earth. When you feel like there is nothing worse that you could have done in your entire life, Jesus wants to be right there with you. And even when you're in your highest place, Jesus wants to be right there with you, lifting him up. We often think that this idea of prayer has to happen on our knees next to our bed with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And we have to recite some super spiritual way of praying. And we got to sound like the pastor sounds when he prays. But no, Jesus just wants you to talk to him. Just talk to him. Be, tell him you're frustrated. Tell him you don't like what's going on. Be honest with him, because he already knows that you're feeling it, so why are you just not saying it like it is to him? There's nothing wrong with it at all. Because when we start getting honest with God and we start actually running to him with our problems and, and telling him things that are going on, you would be surprised at the comfort and the peace that it brings. I'm not saying it's a fix-all. I'm not saying it's a, a, like putting a Band-Aid on a four-year-old who just fell down and has no sign of abrasion on their leg, Okay. But what it is, is we start to get this, this greater peace and this greater understanding of like, you know what? Even in the midst of this, God is still in control. 
I feel like everything's falling apart, but I've taken this to God and I feel like he's got some level of control in here. So when we have this me focus instead of he focus, we have this inactive prayer life. The next thing is that we become completely unaware of miracles. Miracles happen every single day. Every single day. The fact that you're breathing right now is a miracle. The fact that the sun came up this morning is a miracle. You like the fact that like the wor- the earth sits in the place that it does in our solar system is an absolute miracle. If we were literally an inch closer to the sun, we would burn up. If we were an inch further away, we would freeze. If we didn't have the right levels of oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, all that kind of stuff in our air to breathe, we literally wouldn't be able to breathe. And we have no understanding of how all of that takes place. There's this little chemical component in your body called your pH level, and if it was off by like .001, you would die. Something along that line. Rachel just looked at me like, that's not quite right, but it's, you know, it's fine. (laughs) You get what I'm saying. But if if it's off just a little bit, like, that's it. And your body just holds itself so perfectly together. I, I got the privilege of, of seeing my daughter, Poet Born, um, at J- January 19th, 2017. And just, uh, some of you know and some of you don't know the whole story behind that. We were actually told in January 2016 that we probably wouldn't be able to have kids. And then we were told that when we did get pregnant that the, what was going on and the condition that Maria had going on inside of her body, that it would actually... In, potentially attack the embryo in the first trimester and we wouldn't make it through. And so I've got my miracle little girl that I got to see born, that I I got to have that moment with her. And we miss these miracles that are happening because we become so focused on ourselves that we don't see what God's doing even in other people. I had the privilege of going with our students to Myrtle Beach a couple weeks ago. And I got to see the miracle of their lives being changed and challenged that week. It was a beautiful thing. There were tears shed. There was laughter to be had. And it was awesome. I saw it in our kids. I saw it in our leaders. And we got to see two kids give their life to Christ that week for the first time, which is amazing. The other thing, and I'm not going to elaborate on this too much because we've, we've beat it over the head the past couple of weeks, is not sharing your faith. When you become me-focused instead of he-focused, you stop sharing your faith. You stop making God, like, like God should be moving in you in such a way that you shouldn't be able to hold back from sharing what he has done for you. And then my biggest, my biggest point here, if when we become me-focused instead of he-focused, is do you even know God at all? Like, do you know God? Not like, do you know of him, okay? Practically everybody in America knows of God. I mean, it's in our Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. Like, we, we know of this God character, Okay, you go and talk to basically anybody like they know what church is. But do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? And I've got some challenging scripture here for you. Let's look at uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. This is like the scariest set of verses in the Bible for me. He says, this. it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, and he's talking about the end times, he's talking about judgment day. When you go before God, he says, on that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Catch what, he, catch what just happened there. These people that are going to God in the end time, he's saying many people are going to have this moment. They, they prophesied in their name. They cast out demons in their name. They did many mighty works for their name. They were religious as all get out. They looked like that perfect, proper Christian on Sunday morning. They went and did all the things that they were supposed to be doing. But he said, 
all of these works, the mission trips, going and telling other people about Jesus, helping build a wheelchair ramp for somebody, serving food, you know, whatever it is, they're great and they're wonderful things. But those works in and of themselves are not earning your way into heaven. There's not enough stuff in the world that you could do for God that would take away your punishment for sin. The only thing that's going to take away your punishment from sin, from this good and great, wonderful, perfect God, he who cannot be around evil because that would not make him holy anymore. We talked about that last week. The only thing that's going to solve that problem is for you to have a relationship with Jesus. Next verse. This is James uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 19. It says, you believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Those are like two of the scariest sets of verses in the Bible for me. Like I'm like self-checking on that every day. I'm like, okay, God, like I believe in you. Okay, that's great. But do you know God? I mean, the demons are constantly fighting the spiritual battle every single day to try to come in and mess up stuff in your life to keep you further and further from God. They're the ones who are telling you that when you sin, that you need to feel guilty and you need to run and you need to hide it from God instead of running it, just running it to God because he took care of it. They believe in that same God and they shudder. So my question is, do you no, God, are you spiritually woke? Are you actually aware of what's going on? Because if not, today is the day that you need to make that a reality in your life. And it's not, I mean, it took me 18 years. It could take somebody 50 years. It doesn't matter. I just want you to wake up and just see the beautiful thing that God wants to do in your life. He wants a real and true relationship with you. He doesn't want you to fake it. He doesn't want you to pretend that your life is perfect and that you have everything together. He's not asking for you to get it all fixed up first. He's just saying, look, enter this relationship with me and we'll work on it together. We will hit this thing head on together. Life is hard. It's messy. It's imperfect. Bad things happen. But we have a hope and an assurance in Jesus. Let's look at Acts chapter 9 real quick. This is where this big thing happens in Paul's life. He is the persecutor of the church. He's the one who is just ravaging through. And bear with me here for a minute because this is a lot of text, but I just want you guys to get this story that's going on here. So a couple things have happened throughout the rest of chapter 8. And in verse 9 it starts off, But Saul, he was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters from the synagogues to go to Damascus. And if he found anyone belonging to the way, which is the church, they were calling it the way then, men or women, that he might bring them bound to to Jerusalem. So at this point, he is still bound and determined to do the work of the Lord. Like he is thinking, I am doing God's work, okay? I am so focused on this. And, And he is still completely blind at this point. He is on his way to Damascus, another city outside of Jerusalem, and he's looking for Christians, whether they be men, women, what have you, and he is going to bind them. He is going to put them in handcuffs. He is going to drag them to Jerusalem to go into court, and he is going to put them to death, just like what our Savior went through. Verse 3 says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. So he's close to the city. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Like sometimes like we don't really like, we just like read through the scripture, but like just like you gotta put, you gotta put yourself in that story. Like God's like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like on the ground at this point, blinded by the light. He says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood completely speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he went without sight, and he neither ate nor he did he drink. So the funny thing was, if we go back to that uh, passage where he says, Who are you, Lord? Like, he saw Jesus in this moment. Jesus is asking him, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? Like, he recognized in that moment for the first time that Jesus really was God. And he was fighting against God instead of going through with what he was supposed to do. He was so focused up on this religious aspect that he was missing the whole picture. He pushed Jesus aside for his own personal gain. He had power. He had real good power. And persecuting the church, him saying persecuting, I mean, that's an understatement. I mean, Paul was a mass murderer. He goes on, he says, Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and then the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in, and lay hands on him so that he might have his sight. But Ananias answered him, he said, Lord, I have heard about, from many about this man, for how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And hear that he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is rightfully scared at this point. He's heard the stories about Saul. Like he is, he, Saul has made a name for himself at this point. And God is saying, hey, Ananias, I need you to go to this guy who is a murderer of Christians, and I need you to go to him and lay hands on him and pray for him so he, can give, so he can see again. And a lot of times we, we look at ourselves as Ananias is looking at Paul. Or Saul at this point. They say, we say to ourselves, like, I'm just not good enough. I'm too evil for being used by God. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and my children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed with him into the house and went to the house. Laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained sight. Then he rose and he was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. And it goes on and says, For some days he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and were saying, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this same purpose, to bring and bound these people to take them before the chief priests? But Saul increased more and more in strength, and he confounded in the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Paul was finally awoken. These scales had fallen from his eyes. He was spiritually blind for so long. He finally knows who God truly is after claiming it for years and years and years and doing work for him for years and years and years. These scales were finally removed from his eyes and he was able to see that it wasn't about him anymore. It was all about what he was supposed to be doing for God. Southside, it's not about what you are doing. It's about what God is doing through you. <laughs> I can tell you very, very, very clearly that in my life, like I, I sometimes dread coming up here because I'm like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be telling these people this stuff. But it's not about me. It's about what God is doing through me. And he will do the same thing through you. So often we are so fearful of telling somebody about Jesus, because we're like, well, what do we say if they say this? Stop worrying about it. 
Let God take care of it. I used to worry so much about what I was going to say on a, in front of a pulpit on a Sunday morning because I was like, I ain't got a clue on how to say this or speak this in the right way. And if you guys heard me preach for the first time, it was bad. It lasted like 10 minutes. They were happy. They got out for lunch quick, and now I'm holding y'all up. <laughs> Look what God did. <laughs> but this morning, I just I want you guys to really just, it's time for you, for you guys to get woke. To really realize what's going on. Whether this is like you're, you're a first time believer. Maybe this morning like God just kind of spoke to you in a way. And it's in, in such a way that you know I, I'm ready to give my life for the first time 100%. Like I know that this is something that like I don't have in my life. And I want a relationship with him. If that's you this morning, I want you to give your life to Christ. There's no excuse. There's no reason to hold up on that. Maybe you're somebody who just needs to recommit your life to Christ because you've just fallen off the path for a little bit. That's all right. We all have our slip-ups, and that's okay. As a church, we need to be coming together and, and lifting one another up and, and supporting the, the fallen brother or sister. Because we all go through life, we all have mess, and we can just support one another and lift one another up through that. And so if you, if you need to recommit your life to Christ this morning, then let's do it. And for those of you who are like me for so many years and you just totally were just faking it. And you didn't really have a relationship with Jesus. This morning I just pray that you get woke. That you would really see what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And you would make today the day that you give your life to Christ. Now I know, I know that God put this message on my heart this week for a reason. And I know that God wants something big to happen here at Southside this morning. And I'm just asking if you would just open your hearts to what it is that God is trying to do in you. And he will do some amazing things. I look at my own life and how messy and broken it was and still is at times. And how God just uses me in certain ways. I just sit back and I'm like amazed. And God wants to do the same thing with you. We have 65% of this city who needs that same hope. And you are the way to make it happen. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. If this is you this morning, I just ask that you would just take a moment right now and just take it to God.